Stand by SOT1. Standing. Ten seconds. Ready, rolling. Ready, SOT1. Ready. In four, three, two, one. Roll in. From legendary Uncle Studios in beautiful Southern California, welcome to another edition of Work Comp Matters, the central location for you employees, you employers, and of course, we haven't forgotten about you damn independent contractors. And now, here's this week's edition of Work Comp Matters. It is March 11th, 12 noon straight up. Welcome to another edition of Work Comp Matters. We are sponsored by mancavepodcasting.com, 818-357-4120. If you want to do your own podcast and if you don't have the dough, uh, we've got 700 shows for you to choose from, completely free, no obligation. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm joined by John Scalia out in Munich, Germany, and we bring you stories which we both hope will be of interest to you employees, employers, and independent contractors. I want to, well, let's talk about, I want to talk about two stories first, and then we'll go to John. Um, John, you you mentioned in pre-show, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Bay Area News Group, Mushroom Out of Control Federal Judge, or am I mistaken? Yes. Why don't you go ahead and read that story first? Okay, well, let me let me flip to it. Um, this comes from Santa Clara County. Uh, here we go. It's from actually it's from the East Bay Times. Mushroomed out of control. Federal judge urges Santa Clara County to resolve case against Calvary Chapel. In a federal court hearing on Thursday. A judge urged Santa Clara County to resolve its lawsuit against Calvary Chapel, which has refused to pay $2.8 million in fines levied against it for holding large mask-free services during the height of the pandemic. U.S. District Court Judge Beth Lapsom Freeman questioned whether the county suit against the church is a, quote, mountain that the county ought to die on, close quote, and said that the litigation has, quote, mushroomed out of control, close quote. She added that the county, quote, ought to be looking for the right table and the right mediator to sit down and resolve this case as fast as you can. And I say that because cases like this have been settled all over the state, close quote. Freeman's remarks come amid a legal clash between the county and Calvary Chapel that has now stretched for over a year and a half. In June 2020, the church filed suit in federal court, claiming that the county was infringing upon its religious rights. The county fired back, filing a lawsuit in Santa Clara County Superior Court last fall, accusing the church of violating public health orders by hosting the mask-free indoor services. Months later, the church was found in contempt of court by a Superior Court judge for continuing to defy the county's rules. Calvary Chapel is currently challenging the fines in the federal court as cruel and unusual punishment. Now, you know, as a lawyer, I would comment that I find it strange that the judge is referring to other lawsuits which have settled, because theoretically, a judge should only be concerned about the merits of the case and the facts of the case in front of her, not other cases all up and down the state that may or may not have settled, which may or may not have had similar fact conditions. And of course, none of the lawyers are are gonna argue that to the judge or point it out unless they're like me and don't care uh, because the judge would obviously take umbrage at that. And in federal court, the last thing you want is a judge taking umbrage. Now, I also Googled her because, uh, you know, I always find it amazing that these articles pretend as if judges come from Mount Olympus and they don't come with their personal biases. So I Google the judge to see what they are. And actually, Judge Judge Freeman uh, belongs to a Jewish congregation, but it's a reform congregation. And you know, reform congregations in the Jewish faith are very liberal. Uh, I, I analogize them to uh, Unitarians in terms of Christianity, or you know, at the most conservative, like Episcopalians. Uh, 
so she is, you know, she she belongs and she's actually and she works for the temple. She's a volunteer at the temple. So she's a religious person, uh, which also may factor into her attitude. Anyway, uh, here we are again with their, you know, the claim of their, they're always trying to take away our freedom of religion, which is the freedom to ignore any health regulations because God will take care of us. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Um, as John correctly said, settlement discussions are not admissible when you're litigating a case. It doesn't matter what other cases settle for. It doesn't matter uh, what uh, other cases have done. What matters is the evidence in this particular case and how the evidence is weighed. And, uh, you know, a, a court apparently has found uh, the uh, Calvary Chapel in contempt of court, which is never a good thing. What I find amazing, however, is that uh, the lawsuit, uh, the fines went up to almost three million dollars uh, against the church. And uh, of course, now basically it's all academic. I don't believe there's any evidence in there uh, in the case that says because of this, people have died. But that uh, also arguably is irrelevant. Also, I I completely agree that the thing should be settled uh, because, you know, Santa Clara County, you, you really want to take on a church and religious freedoms. Uh, John, you got a closing thought on this? Yeah, I think you do. I, I, I think that the, uh, the right, this is a right wing conservative fundamentalist church. And I think their idea of religious freedom means we can do whatever we want because God has given us an option to ignore the American Constitution, to ignore the laws of civil society, to ignore any laws uh, which we deem against the will of God. And I think that's ridiculous. And I think it's it's about time that somebody calls one of these churches to account to say, no, I'm sorry, you're part of the United States of America. If you don't like obeying the laws, go somewhere else, you know? Um, plain and my, simple. Yeah, plain and simple. Uh, my next story is right above that, John. The Washington Post mask mandate extended for air travel and public transit. Of course, all of our listeners uh, travel. I assume some uh, fly by air. This is why I'm reading the story. Travelers will have to continue to wear masks until at least April 18th when flying commercially and in other transportation settings, including buses, ferries, and subways. Officials announced yesterday the mandate put into place early last year by the Biden administration as a public health measure during the coronavirus pandemic has been extended multiple times. It had been set to expire March 18 before the one month extension announced by the Transportation Security Administration. John. Okay, my story is uh, actually a much milder story. It's the first one that's on the uh, on the website today. It's despite senior strong desire to age in place, the village model remains a boutique option. Now, as I'm sure everybody is tired of hearing me say, I certainly qualify as a senior citizen. I'm 75 years old. 20 years ago, a group of pioneering older adults in Boston created an innovative organization for people committed to aging in place. And I, I identify with that. I don't want to age anywhere other than where I live. Beacon Hill Village, an all-in-one social club, volunteer collective, activity center, peer-to-peer -peer support group, and network for various services. Its message of, quote, we want to age our way in our homes and our community, close quote, was groundbreaking at the time and commanded widespread attention. Villages would mobilize neighbors to serve neighbors, anchor older adults in their communities, and become an essential part of the infrastructure for aging in place in America, experts predicted. And the article goes on to point out that, as most predictions, uh, it didn't really come true, that, that there are a whole bunch of these uh, villages in the United States, but they're extremely limited. There's 268 with more than 40,000 members. And most of them don't qualify for any kind of government subsidies. And the article later on goes on to talk about the fact that most of these, most of these co-ops have very small budgets and they mostly manage on volunteers. There's one that does have a significant budget and ask, is asking for significant funding. And here's my take on it. My take is why doesn't somebody do a study and find out how much money society saves 
by allowing seniors to age in place as opposed to having them use societal resources uh, in places like, uh, you know, assisted living facilities, convalescent hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. I suspect that any study would say, you know, this is a cost-effective measure, and maybe there should be some kind of government funding to encourage these kinds of programs. Thank you, John. Controversial mental health care activist is running for governor. Activist and author Michael Schellenberger announced yesterday that he will run for California governor as an independent. Schellenberger, the author of San Fran Sicko, has long criticized the Newsom administration and other leaders, or actually criticized Gavin Newsom and other leaders for not building a better psychiatric health care system to help get mentally ill and drug addicted people into treatment. Well, I don't know what building a better facility is going to do. I think you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. John. Well, you know, I don't think that society makes a real effort to try to get these people help. But, you know, that's that's another story. But st sticking with uh, California, this article is from the L.A. Times. Former Hollywood film executive will plead guilty to pocketing fraudulent COVID-19 loans. A Beverly Hills resident and former chief executive of Aberon Pictures has agreed to plead guilty to federal fraud and money laundering charges after he pocketed nearly $1 million in Paycheck Protection Program loans meant to help businesses pay workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. William Sadlier, 67, agreed to plead guilty to one count each of bank fraud and money laundering and is scheduled to formally enter the pleas next week according to an announcement by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Central District of California. He has already pleaded guilty in a separate federal fraud case in New York for misappropriating more than $25 million that was invested in Averon, prosecutors said. In the California case, sadly, he filed applications that fraudulently sought more than $1.7 million in PPP loans for three Averon companies that had already shut down, prosecutors said. Such loans were guaranteed by the U.S. Small Business Administration and designed to be forgiven for companies that spent most of the money on payroll costs and avoided cutting jobs. Okay, here's my question. If these companies were, I mean, how, how difficult would it be to have researched to find out these companies weren't, 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 didn't exist, weren't working, didn't have any employees? We're not real companies at the time. I mean, come on. I mean, it can't be that difficult to go in and say, well, you know, are you really operating? I mean, honestly, I mean, how much time of somebody's, how much time would that take for somebody to research whether or not this guy's company actually was functioning and had employees and was making a payroll? Really? Steve. As the Omicron surge of the coronavirus continues to wane, Los Angeles County has been lifting COVID-19 mandates including indoor masking and vaccine verification in certain settings. And uh, this is quite interesting. And I wanted to bring up one other story here. This is from the Modesto B. John. An infectious disease expert for Kaiser Permanente said he would not be surprised if a COVID-19 vaccination becomes an annual routine to guard against endemic coronavirus disease. Dr. Stephen Perotti, clinical lead for Kaiser's coronavirus response, said in his session with the media Wednesday that the strong immunity conferred by, conferred by coronavirus vaccines is short term, pending the results of additional uh, monitoring people may be rolling up their sleeves for a booster shot every year for protection against the variants of the SARS COVID-2 virus, he said. It could be in the form of a combination vaccine for COVID-19 and seasonal flu. You're dialed into Work Comp Matters. We're sponsored by mancavepodcasting.com. Uh, 700 shows in the tank. Check us out. They're at your disposal. Back to our news, John. 
Prosecutors say California hospice fraud scheme cost government $30 million, three indicted. Felony federal charges were filed against three people, including two Southern California residents, accused in a scheme that defrauded the government of more than $30 million for hospice services provided to patients who were not terminally ill at two Pasadena-based hospice companies, according to the U.S. Department of Justice. Dr. Victor Contreras, 66, of Santa Paula, and Callie Jean Black, 63, of Lancaster, were arrested Tuesday, March 8, and named in a 14-count indictment filed in U.S. District Court in Los Angeles. Juanita Antonor, 59, a former Pasadena resident and owner of the hospice companies, was also named in the indictment. Contreras and Black pleaded not guilty on Tuesday and were granted release on bond, said Tom Rojak, spokesman for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles. The article goes on to say, okay, Antonor owned Arcadia Hospice Provider, Inc., one of the hospice companies listed in the indictment, and remains at large, according to the Department of Justice. She is believed to be in the Philippines. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, this is going again. To the, I mean, my God, you know, how does the money, does the government just crank out money uh, without ever checking on whether or not anybody's telling them the truth? I mean, again, how how long into the process? I mean, how long did it take to pay out $30 million before a light bulb went on in some low-level bureaucrat's brain that said, gosh, maybe we should check whether this is legitimate? Or again, how hard could it be? I mean, if this woman's in the, in the Philippines, uh, that, that's a good indication that, you know, some, something funny was going on. But I mean, really, $30 million, and then they finally say, oops, uh, looks like we've been paying this money on, on fraudulent documentation. Uh, I, that, to me, that's ridiculous. Steve. A, a massive spending bill for the fiscal year that began over five months ago is headed to President Biden's desk after the Senate cleared it for his signature late last night putting an end to a frenzied stretch of negotiations in both chambers this week. On a 68 to 31 vote, the Senate passed the 2,700 page, one and a half trillion dollar omnibus containing all 12 fiscal 2022 spending bills, a $13.6 billion dollars in supplemental appropriations to address the crisis in Ukraine, don't know what that means, and a lengthy list of unrelated measures fortunate enough to ride the must-pass vehicle. Leaders in both parties spent hours Thursday negotiating with GOP senators trying to reach an agreement on amendments they were seeking that would allow for unanimous consent agreement to proceed to the bill quickly. Uh, John, growing up, you both, you, sorry, John. The $13 billion for Ukraine, that's a combination of humanitarian assistance and military aid. I read about it. So it's, it's, yeah. So it's, it's getting them, it's getting them uh, artillery, well, it's getting them armaments, And it's also providing for humanitarian aid that they need, thanks to the fact that their country is being bombed to bits by by Russia, which, by the way, Russian Russian TV has controlled, you know, as you know, I mean, Russia is a complete dictatorship and it's a completely authoritarian state. And they have shut down any any means for their people to to find out what's really going on. Uh, and, And there was an example today where somebody had a relative because Ukrainians have a lot of relatives in Russia, and he called up his relative in Russia to tell him that, you know, that a place where he was living or nearby had just been bombed. And the relative being Russian said, no, you're, that's not true. There's no bombs being dropped. Uh, you know, you're, you're, just, you're just making that up. Uh, you know, it's, it's unbelievable what you can do when you're an authoritarian state and you've got everybody believing all the propaganda that you put over the total state-controlled media, which is the only media that most of them can ever get. Yeah, yeah, but this is Russia, so this is nothing new. Well, actually, you know, it, it, it's gotten a lot worse. I mean, it, it is Russia, and Russia has always been 
not always, but it's yeah, pretty much always been a dictatorship and an authoritarian state. But there were alternative news outlets in Russia until very recently. Uh, there were independent news outlets. They've all been shut down in the last few weeks, actually. Uh, so there were, in fact, independent news outlets in Russia. There was the ability to access stuff in Russia, but now the, now the Russian government is, has basically booted them all out. Almost all the people that worked on any of those independent newspapers or websites, they're in exile now. Uh, some of them are still ma are making plans so that they can still get their news into Russia for the people who want to find it. Uh, because they did have viewers. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's really, you know, it's, it's a wartime dictatorship now as opposed to a peacetime dictatorship. And they're just circling, circling the wagons, as we, you know, as we said in the West. Uh, and that's that's exactly what they're doing. And, and they're just pretending uh, that the West is just out to crush Russia because uh, the West hates Russia. And so all these sanctions are irrational and they're not, you know, they're, they're denying all the reality on the ground. I mean, they're simply denying it. And because they control the media and they control the narrative in Russia, the Russian people are unable to find out what's going on, most of them. On the other hand, some of them have already been, you know, there've been a number of arrests all through Russia of people who were protesting the war because they didn't see any reason to attack Ukraine. John, I have the next story also. I know it's two in a row from the Wall Street Journal. Blue Cross Blue Shield owner Anthem seeks to change name to Elevance Health. Now, normally a company like this, when they change their name, something is going wrong. Like, for example, Facebook uh, went ahead and uh, changed to Metaverse. Everybody I know still calls it Facebook. I know a, a big insurance company back during the Obama administration, I forgot, changed its name and then changed it back. Uh, but here's your story, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield owner Anthem. Anthem Inc. plans to change its name to Elevance Health Incorporated. Elevance Health Incorporated, aiming to recast itself as a company with a broader portfolio and focus than its traditional business of health insurance. Anthem, which owns Blue Cross and Blue Shield in 14 states, will need shareholder approval to make the change. The vote is scheduled to occur May 18th. So for those of you that have Blue Cross, Blue Shield, owned by Anthem, that will probably be approved by stockholders, and your new name will be Elevance Health. John. Yeah, I find that that amusing, actually. I mean, why, why don't they just, you know, call it mega, mega giant corporation who's out to own everything we can? I don't know. I mean, it, you're right. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, well, why do they need to change the name for me? Anthem is actually a, a non-descriptive term anyway. I mean, my God, Anthem, the meaning of Anthem is it's a, it's a song. An Anthem is a song. You know, they're an insurance company. Why are they named Anthem? I mean, you know, an elevance, I don't even think that's a real word. It sounds like something they made up. Uh, you know, they're marketing people or something. I don't know why. But anyway, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, something, something, something's wrong in Denmark. Okay, woman, woman whose rape kit DNA was used to arrest her intends to sue San Francisco. A woman whose DNA from a sexual assault examination was later used by police to arrest her in connection with an unrelated property crime, plans to sue the city and county of San Francisco, her attorney announced Thursday. By the way, for those of you in Southern California, the city and county of San Francisco are the same thing, okay? It's coterminous. There's no, it's not like LA where the county is this huge conglomeration of other cities. In San Francisco, the city and county are identical. Adante Pointer and his client intend to file the lawsuit after a 45-day waiting period mandated by law. The San Francisco Police Department, quote, and perhaps other police departments have been compiling a Google-like database of crime survivors' DNA, which they then use to investigate unrelated crimes, close quote, Pointer said. There doesn't appear to be an expiration date or limit on how authorities use the DNA, the attorney said, if victims aren't provided notice that their DNA is being stored for use in future criminal investigations and any number of other activities. This is like giving the police access to your cell phone to look at evidence of a specific crime and they keep searching it for years to come in order to implicate you in other crimes that all without you having any notice or warning, Pointer said. 
Charges against the woman were dropped. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that, you know, I assume the charges were dropped because the DA said, oops, if we go to court, the judge isn't going to let this evidence in because they're going to say you, you took it and, you know, it's years ago and you didn't tell her it could be used for possible criminal prosecution down the line. You will note there's not a single word about her being innocent of the charges. All right. So the only question here is whether the evidence was illegally obtained. Well, no, obviously it was not illegally obtained. I mean, she willingly gave it to prove that she was raped. The question is one of notice. The question is, you know, she didn't sign a release saying, by the way, I'm, I'm allowing you to use this DNA evidence in any which way you want, aside from the, in addition to when it, using it for the prosecution, prosecution of my rapist. So that is the real problem. And that's probably where the DA said, oops, uh, you know, from now on, you just we're, we're just not we're going to drop the charges and they're going to end up settling with her, no doubt. The question is, will somebody in the DA's office, you know, say we should provide a, a release form from the from the victim saying that we can keep the DNA and use it in further future investigations? And my suspicion would be uh, that all your civil liberties organizations would say, no, you know, it's for a specific crime. You can only use it for the specific crime. So, and it is kind of it is kind of astounding to think that when you get when you submit to a rape examination, a rape kit, that they're going to keep it on file and later on use it to prosecute you for a property crime. Steve and John, I thank you very much for that. Any uh, closing thoughts or burning desires? No, I just think it's uh, it's it's interesting that. You know, America is is providing whatever assistance it can. Uh, they're they're trying to draw a very fine line. They're, they don't want to provoke Putin into a wider war. But my analogy is, you know, that's what they said about Hitler too. And you know, you don't have to provoke guys like that into a wider war. It's not going to be long before Putin says, you know, East Berlin was part of part of the part of East Germany, and East Germany doesn't belong as part of Germany. Yeah, that's coming. All right, John. Well, listen, thank you very much. Appreciate it always. Have yourself a fantastic weekend uh, for uh, Scott Walton of Legendary Uncle Studios, John Scalia out in Munich, Germany, all the good people back at mancavepodcasting.com. My name is Steve Appel. We'll see you again Monday, 12 noon live for another edition of Work Matters. Bye, everybody. 